right. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for, for having me here for what, what has actually been a very interesting opportunity, I think, to talk already about science and, and how we, we think about problems and so on and so forth. I actually found a lot of the discussions yesterday enlightening. Um, so I, I view this as a good chance to um, try to articulate not only you know what I do as a particle physicist, but also uh, what, what science is and how we do it and how particle physics and its details relate into the broader discussions uh, of how we sort of build knowledge as a community. Um, so, with that, let me also just say that um, I have slides with a lot of stuff on them. There will not be a test on any of the, the math at any point. It's just there to illustrate a few things, and it's not the most important part. But um, please feel free to interrupt me with anything I should talk more or less about, um, because I'm, I'm very happy to, within the allotted time, to, to cover whatever is of interest to you. But I do um, do sort of start with the Higgs boson and get the methodology more and more as we go. So um, I should have some introductory slides. And I do. They've been written for me in part by the Swedish Academy and uh, part by Noel Rumsfeld. So let's start with the Academy. So last week, uh, Francois Anglais and uh, Peter Higgs won the Nobel Prize for um, inventing the Higgs mechanism, which explains a lot of the masses in what we call the standard model of particle physics, which is our now complete, just latest and greatest understanding of the fundamental particles that make up all the matter um, that we've ever been able to poke. Uh, so they have kind of right in the description here, you know, the theoretical discovery of this mechanism that I will describe for giving masses to things uh, that was discovered by the ATLAS and CMS experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. So I work for this one. I used to work for that one. Here's a picture of many of my colleagues at CERN watching the Nobel Prize webcast with a, a certain amount of enthusiasm. So, <laughs> of course, we're, we're pleased to see this research recognized, and this has been a goal for you know, five decades since this, the work they won the prize for was um, done. So, we've seen this quote before, but I think it's incredibly relevant to thinking about uh, science and uncertainty, right? There are known knowns, unknown knowns, and unknown, no, sorry, known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown knowns, right? We have, we have things we calculate, uh, uncertainties that we model, right? We build models not only of the science we're trying to describe, but also models of the uncertainty, and I will go into how we do that. Uh, but then there are things that we don't know we don't know. And they, that creates problems. And that's what, what gives you wrong answers in science. And so part of science is the mechanisms for what you do when you have problems like that. And I'll discuss those too. So let's start with what we know. Uh, this is a very brief survey of the standard model of particle physics. Uh, there are quarks that you put together, the two lightest ones, and they make up protons and neutrons, which is most of the mass in everyday matter. Then balancing out the charge of those is electrons. That's all chemistry so far. Um, and then it turns out there are, for all of these different types of quarks and leptons, there are two more generations of heavier pairs that go with them. And then there are particles that carry forces over here. Um, and the WZ and photon all have a lot to do each other, with each other, as I will explain. Um, so let's look at one thing we can ask about particles, which is how heavy they are, they? how much mass do they have? So um, electrons have a mass of 500 kilo electron volts. And what you need to know about that really is that the mass of a proton, or equivalently the mass of a hydrogen atom, is a little less than one uh, giga electron volt. So that's just what you should treat as a scale rather than worrying about um, you know, how, what the definition of an electron volt is, for example. That's not really what's important here. Um, 
So coming in at 1.78 GeV is the tap, a very heavy electron, a very different number. That's five, or no, it's about three, three and a half orders of magnitude different. We get five orders of magnitude when we go up here from the lightest quark at two mega electron volts, the heaviest at 173 giga electron volts. And now we have our force carrying particles, the W, the Z, and the photon. Uh, and when you look at these numbers, in fact, if I filled in all the numbers on this page, um, you would see there are no particles that come in at about the same mass, you know, to within, say, 10 or 20 percent, except the W and the Z. So the way physicists like to think, and I, it happens to be true in this case, is something is going on with the W and Z that relates them. Their mass is part of the same phenomenon. So let's start with that. Um, as it turns out, the photon is also involved. And this brings us to what the prize was awarded for, the brown Higgs mechanism. It seems to be what we're calling it these days. Uh, Professor Brout would also have won the Nobel Prize last week um, had he not passed away a few years ago. So where do particle masses come from? This is about to be one of the very nasty slides. So. In the standard model, you have a formalism called a, a Lagrangian, which is an equation from which you can extract the behavior of particles and fields. And the first thing I'd like to point out is that the part that involves this Higgs field, that we're gonna be, is gonna be the, the discovery of which is the focus of this talk, starts out quite simple. You have, or at least it looks compact, you have a, a derivative that contains interactions with a particular symmetry that we initially are going to draw like that, and then a potential for this field. And when you expand it out, you get um, an ugly thing that reflects the particular symmetry that is going to turn into the W and Z and photon. And at the moment, um, <clears throat> they're actually entirely symmetric. So what can we say about this? Right, so as I said, there's a, there's a symmetry built in between the W and the Z and the photon here. But that symmetry doesn't exist in nature. First of all, particles are not allowed to have mass in the Lagrangian. It, it disobeys the symmetry rules that we build all of physics on. And second of all, the photon is massless, and the W and Z are quite heavy. So if there were a mass term in the Lagrangian, it would look something like the mass times a field squared which I've just written as W squared. Now, if we take this mess and we multiply it out, um, you actually get terms that look like, you know, literally there's a squared here, so there's a W here, a phi here, and that's all you really need to know. Phi squared and then W squared. So what this is, actually, is an interaction between two Higgses and two Ws. It's a four-point interaction. So it could describe a Higgs and a W bouncing off each other, or two Higgses going in and two Ws going out, so on and so forth. As long as this Higgs field is an ordinary field, that's what it would describe. However, the Higgs field is not an ordinary field. So if for some reason this Higgs field, instead of being zero in the empty space, that is, which is true for every other particle, right? If there's no electron somewhere, the value of the electron field is zero. If there's no W, the value of the W field is zero. But if for some reason the Higgs had a non-zero value, that is a vacuum expectation value, then when there wasn't a Higgs boson anywhere, these terms like this would turn into B squared W squared, which looks like and acts like, in theory, a mass term. So this arises going over to the right side because we have this potential for the Higgs. It basically looks like what we call it a Mexican hat, right? Zero is right in the middle here, but it's not the minimum of this potential. And what the way potentials work in general in a scientific context is the system has some energetic incentive to minimize it. So as the universe cooled, uh, the potential was minimized. And in fact, there's flexibility for what direction the potential is minimized in. 
because I've cheated and not told you that this phi is a multi-component vector and not really a, a single number. So the point is that this direction is arbitrary, but once it's fixed, it makes the w's and the z's and the photons different from each other. And the photon is massless because it just happens to be the field that's in the direction where the Higgs doesn't give it any mass. So how is the Higgs giving mass? The point is there's this interaction, but even in empty space, the Higgs field has its value. So basically, the w and the z are bouncing off the Higgs all the time in empty space. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I think about the coordinates of that picture. Is uh, that three space or is that something else? So even this picture is cheating, but it's an illustration um, so I, I think the way it's drawn here, these are actually the real and imaginary components of, of phi, and in fact, it's a, it's a this symmetry group corresponds to actions on a two-component vector, both of which components are complex numbers. So if that helps you think about the coordinates, feel free. But the point is, up and down is the value of this potential, and around is just the choice of where on this potential the universe wants to sit. And it sits here. And, and none of these actually would describe a different universe because we had the symmetry for before, and then we broke it. And the photon is just the name of the particle that comes massless out of that mass. So a neat trick you can pull at the very end of this is in a much more ad hoc way, you can say, well, maybe all the other particles also bounce off the next field. You can just give them not sort of this deep symmetry breaking interaction with the Higgs field, but just a simple say, okay, they also interact with the Higgs field. Um, and that, that's actually an important point that relates to what the next things we can learn about the Higgs are, which is, okay, so what are we getting out of this mathematical mess that I've just given you a brief survey of? Photons are massless. Okay, we already knew that for a long time before any of this was invented. Much more importantly, the W and Z goes on masses <coughs> relate to the strength of the weak nuclear force in particular ways. So all these measurements people already knew about, once this mechanism was invented, you could predict the W and Z mass and their ratio before they were found. So in fact, when the W and Z were found at CERN in the 1980s, we already had confirmation something like the Higgs mechanism was happening because the masses came in right. Everything hangs together. Uh, so, with this mechanism, we have the Higgs boson. Everything is predicted, but it's mass, which is why we spent a long time looking for it. Because we, we said, oh, it must not be too heavy, right? We'll look for it at the masses that our next accelerator can reach. And then it didn't repeatedly um, until we, we figured out we were finally at the last one, and indeed there we were. It was in basically the hardest place to look. Um, <coughs> So if the Higgs boson is also responsible for all the fermion masses, then we know it has to couple strongly to the heavy fermions and not so much to light fermions. And I'll show a slide with more about that in a minute. So the point is, as I said, the W and Z were discovered in the 80s at CERN. The top quark was discovered at Fermilab in the mid-90s. And that completed the standard model except for the Higgs. So you could already you know, see things were hanging together well, and we were just missing that piece. And then we finally found the Higgs in uh, 2012. So the instrument to change gears that we use to find this is the LHC. Um, so I live about here. This is the airport, and I work over here. And this is a picture of the greater Geneva area. So there's the lake, and there's the, the Alps, and so on and so forth. Um, and this 27-kilometer ring runs under both the Swiss and French borders, about 100 meters underground. Um, and there are eight points that I can point out that's now to you where there could be collisions, and about four or five of them have detectors. So let's, let's put the facts up now. Um, so every second, uh, the beams at the LHC cross 30 million times. It's a 40, 40 uh, megahertz machine, but then some of the spots are empty for various technical reasons. But because the, um, the beams are so dense with protons, you get many collisions each time. We were doing an average of 20 or 30 before. Someday we're going to go up to 140. 
because our goal is really to learn as much as we can, as quickly as we can, and also to make life hard for the graduate students who are dealing with data that has more and more collisions in it. Um, so it, basically, we have protons at you know, 4 TeV per proton in the past and 7 TeV in the future. And thanks very simply E equals mc squared, you collide them together and you have a whole bunch of energy that's available for making new particles. And you make all sorts of new particles. And the Higgs is one of the very rarest. But it happens if you run enough collisions at a billion a second for a couple of years. I'm really yeah. sure, can you give a bit of the order of magnitude of the rarity? So I once calculated out um, how many Higgses in any of the, the K channels we search for have ever been produced at the LHC. And I got about uh, 400,000 over a couple of years. And you know, you, you figure a billion crossings a second. We have an uptime of about 10 billion seconds a year, maybe, which is about a third of the year um, in terms of 24 hour a day running. So you get, it's very, very rare in short. Uh, so we're also, uh, we have these two major experiments that already came up, CMS and ATLAS, that are general purpose experiments that really are trying to get a handle on everything in the collision. Uh, and they're each storing about a gigabyte a second of data, which is far less. That doesn't mean we have one flight of data about every collision. Rather, it means that we have, starting with hardware and eventually moving to real-time software farms, tools for identifying the collisions that we might want to take a further look at, and we only store those. So we're storing a few hundred or maybe a thousand collisions a second, and they take up at about a, a megabyte each. And so here's one of the instruments that you build at a collision point at the LHC. And you have people here for scales, and this is one part of the detector being installed. Um, this is the smaller of the two general purpose detectors, uh, weighing in at only 15 meters high, uh, but also the heavier at 12,000 tons. Uh, so it's actually built around a very large magnetic field that's used for tracking charged particles, as I'll show you a bit about in a moment. Um, and it really is, it's sort of an onion of, of technologies that are designed to pick apart which particles went where by um, utilizing the, the ways in which different particles interact or even decay inside the detector. Uh, I'll give you some details of that, but to build this thing took, uh, takes a few thousand physicists um, and at least a thousand engineers and technicians that are at least currently working on the project uh, at you know 180, universities and labs in 42 countries, uh, which the United States is the, the largest contributor, in fact. Uh, so that's pretty big business. And what does this thing do? Well, here is now a wedge out of the detector where I've demonstrated, or I, whoever made this beautiful picture has demonstrated, really, um, how different particles behave. <coughs> So inside a giant magnetic field in the center is a tracker. So particles that are charged are curving in this magnetic field, and they are hitting these fairly sparse layers of silicon detectors that give you points. And from these points, you connect the dots. You see the curvature of the particle. And the, the more energy the particle has, the less it gets curved by this giant magnetic field. So you can measure energies one way with that. Now, some particles. Um, called hadrons get stopped in this big wedge of metal called a hadron calorimeter here that really measures energy by absorbing it all and then seeing how much energy actually turns into molecular ex excitations in a, a block of, of brass. Then there are muons that <coughs> curve one way in the magnetic field here and then when the, the magnetic field returns back the other way so the field lines can complete uh, they curve back the other way. And there are special detectors out here to do essentially more tracking of the muons. And we know they're muons, because no other particle acts like that. So 
by basically following all these particles. There are also neutral particles like the photon, where you see nothing in the tractor. And then all the energy gets left right at the front of the calorimeter uh, because of the particular interactions that photons are involved in. So by putting together the signals in these detectors, we can see what particles are coming out of the collision. So here's a particular candidate event. Um, you see a lot of stuff in here that is probably what catches the eye in most pictures we put out. These particles are boring. How do I know they're boring? They're curving a lot. That means they don't have much energy. This is, this is crap that comes out of a proton-proton collision. Um, <laughs> my, my advisor, who's a that theorist, um, used to call the proton a garbage scow. Right, protons are made of three quarks, and they're full of the gluons and quarks that are binding the main quarks together that are flitting in, out of, in and out of existence all the time. So when you have an exciting collision, you're really blowing this guy apart, and you get a lot of detritus, and it's useful, but it's not the interesting thing. The interesting thing are these huge deposits in the electromagnetic calendar that are here and here. Those are photons. This is consistent with the Higgs decaying to two photons. On our next slide, uh, we have sort of a different perspective. This is not now looking end on. This is turning the cylinder to its side. You can see in particular that the boring stuff is mostly going to the front and back uh, along the LHC beam pipe, essentially, or close to it. And the exciting stuff is more towards the center because it can go in any direction. So. At least much of the time, it goes to the center, which is where we can detect it best. And in this collision, there are two muons that we interpret as coming from the Z boson, and two jets of hadrons that could be from the Higgs. So when the Higgs decays to quarks, uh, you have to deal with the fact that quarks don't last by themselves. They're extremely strongly interacting. So as you send two quarks apart from each other, they build more and more pairs of quarks out of the huge energy buildup until you get stable particles again. As a result, two outgoing quarks become jets of two, three, five, eight, ten hadrons. You don't know the number, but by building these cones <coughs> that capture an area of hadronic activity, you can start to tease apart those jets. And we have more. Yeah, go ahead. Just real quick, can you comment on use of the term candidate event on this in the previous slide? Certainly. Um, let me actually comment on it when I get to something that illustrates it well in a couple of slides. But remind me if I forget. If I get to the slide with the animation and I don't tell you what I meant by that, remind me. Um, but just one more thing about these, um, these hadronic jets here. Because they are from B quarks, the hadrons that uh, bees live in actually travel for maybe a centimeter in the detector. So uh, not only are we collecting hadronic energy out of our calorimeter here, we're also tracking back the tracks, the charged hadrons in this jet, and we're seeing they don't come from the same place as the rest of the collision. And this is another thing in our toolkit that's very important, because it hits is going to decay preferentially into B quarks because that's the heaviest thing it's again decayed into. So what are we doing with all this data in these pictures? We don't look at these pictures to figure out what's actually going on. What we really do is we make an awful lot of graphs and look for correlations between variables and build up models that are supported by what we see. So this data is taken in real time and stored. We have thousands of collaborators, so what do we do with it? So we have team analysis teams within the experiment that are um, putting together tools that do different steps of our understanding of physics. So the whole experiment has common tools for taking electrical signals in a calorimeter and turning this into, here's a jet of this energy. So we use, for example, or for all the other particles, we identify them all with common tools. Then we have procedures for particular variables we can use to describe the particles um, that are consistent with the signal, which means, in this case, the Higgs boson that we're looking for, or the background, which is a collision that's anything else. Um, so for example, 
one thing we can do is if we have a Higgs to two photons or a Higgs to two photon candidate, as I've said, we can ask if those two photons are from a Higgs, what would that Higgs's mass be? Because the Higgs mass is always the same. So you're going to see a pattern there. That's the simplest example, and I'm actually going to come back to the mass of putting two particles together like that a lot in this talk. Quick question. So that kind of what you just said, is that kind of the, the real core of the search for? Yeah, I mean, so that, 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 that's the, yeah, yeah. yeah, I would just, yeah, it is um, for many of the channels. The, the mass is absolutely critical. But I mean, is that yes. a combination of other events that you've observed and for the mass? So, so it, I, the, the point is you, right, you, you infer the mass of the Higgs from you, you have some criteria that identify things that could be a Higgs, and then you see if they show up especially at some particular mass. I have some, some plots that will uh, show you this, I think, in a moment. Uh, so then we have common tools also for statistical analysis and plotting and all of these things, and eventually um, these ideas get turned into publications that are actually signed by every single person on the experiment. We all, and I'll talk more about our internal review classes later, it's worth noting that most of the work of being a physicist is not uh, doing physics. This actually came up yesterday. Most of the work of being a physicist is taking very complex data and thinking about how to slice it and dice it, how to put all these particles together so that we learn something about them. And once you know how to do that, then you can write a paper that says, we asked for these types of events with these particular um, objects in them, and we asked them to have these energies and to be in these ranges, and we observed in our simulation that that will help us find Higgs is the best, and now here's how we know that. But the, a lot of the work of the physicist is putting together these tools and then playing. Also, we need an awful lot of CPU. Um, so uh, we have this worldwide grid computing infrastructure um, that stores the smallest estimate I've seen is 15 petabytes a year um, on computers at all these labs. And so, of course, we don't download the data for individual user analyses. First, we have common jobs that simplify the data into smaller packets. And then we send the processing we personally want to do to wherever the data is. Um, so. We have these very large samples of simulated events. It actually takes up a lot more space than the real data uh, because we need a very small statistical uncertainty on our simulated predictions. Because otherwise, you're introducing a completely fixable error into your analysis if you just flipped a bunch of coins and had bad luck in your simulation. Uh, so each simulated event is independent. And indeed, each process data event is independent. You know, we have one collision, we measure every, we store everything we're going to store, you process it later. So there's no supercomputing here. These are all just very large farms <coughs> running the same software over and over. Yeah? So this whole thing was a huge, it's a huge engineering enterprise and required a whole lot of planning by a lot of people in a lot of countries yeah. uh, to, get to, the, to get to this point. Can you, will you say anything about how that got started? To, I mean, when you say doing, you know, a lot of times this suspend this is what you consider doing physics. On the other hand, you could look at that another way, which is doing physics actually involves a lot of other stuff. Yeah. Just the way Alessandro's paper yesterday morning, I think, showed that he was a, his objective was to learn one particular thing, but he had to do a lot of other stuff in trying to figure out how to get yeah. there. Right. And I, I think this is this is really important. Um, physicists are the people who think about what we need to chain together to do this. So people decades ago um, said, identified that the, at some point the accelerators they had, or the accelerators they were still even finishing then, were going to be insufficient for the next round of problems. And so of course they, you know, they ran a bunch of simulations of what you would do with a higher energy machine, um, and what what physics would look like there, and in particular, um, you know, you make you make the case that we need to go to this energy to be sure we can find the Higgs boson. Here's some other things and what they would look like. 
here are the kinds of detectors you would build, and you sketch that out very roughly, um, starting at almost a, a theoretical level, and then you fill in details, right? And you have technical proposals, um, and you have many, many, many engineers. I mean, of course, there are very important things that physicists don't touch. I'm allowed to code badly. I'm, about, I'm allowed to run statistical tools that I haven't personally looked at the insides of. Nobody lets me do the mechanical supports for a 12,000 ton detector because the whole enterprise is ruined if it, it rolls off somewhere. So of course we have engineers for that. Uh, yeah. So is it always or necessarily the case that the data that comes out of an experiment specified by one group goes into this common pool where it's then available to everybody? So the, the, the way this works in, in our field is basically the people who have paid their dues in making the detector happen. So that means either uh, were involved in the construction for a long time or have now committed to maintenance tasks, you know, including, for example, running the computing. Um, they are on the experiment. They, and they have access to all the common data and they have the freedom to analyze it the way they would like. And at that point, we can have arguments among analysis groups. I'll talk later about, sorry, the analysis group were on the previous page. Um, I'll talk later about how, how we deal with this, where you know, MIT might process the data in one way and say we have this, and another group might process the data slightly differently and say we have that, and then you have discussions, and eventually we're going to come out with a combined result in most cases from that internal discussion. Yeah. At some point, the data comes public, right? This is a good question. Um, so we have committed in the near term while we are running to, with a couple of year lag, making a simplified form of some fraction of our data public. And you imagine by the time the experiment is done, Right when we actually disband, turn off the lights, all these things, which will not happen for decades, um, we'll make it all available in some legacy form. That's clearly the goal. We're a little bit slow about making the data public um, because, first of all, we're worried that people who didn't work on the detector uh, are going to find it very easy to make quick and dirty estimates. If you don't spend a lot of time going, here are the errors associated with my detector, you get a better result. You get a faster result and you publish it. Um, and that's not good science. And also it would make people who have spent decades of their lives building a machine for the analysis that they want to do, not because they really like building machines per se, a little bit unhappy if we got scooped as part of our own work. So we view the experiment as the experiment. Right? We, you could also view it as a billion experiments run every second that we repeat all the time, but we view it as uh, we started building it and we look at the data first and we'll tell you what we found and then at some point and on the off chance we missed something other people will look. So let me circle around, I have more sociology later, um, to the Higgs boson. So, uh, this is another sort of tough chart here, but this is what we had to look at a lot when we started, is potential masses of the Higgs boson. We knew it weighed at least, you know, sort of 90 times what a proton weighs when we started the LHC. And then going up to the ranges it could possibly have, and then looking what it's produced along with. So, you know, this chart essentially should be read left to right, all of these four of uh, two gluons come in and out comes the Higgs. And in between there's actually interactions with what are called virtual top and bottom quarks. These are other particles that exist temporarily that facilitate the interaction. Um, and so the Higgs can be produced by itself in this way or it can be produced um, along with two other um, quarks, for example, these Fs are for fermions, so these are going to be quarks or along with a W or Z boson, or along with two top quarks. And all of these production rates depend on the Higgs interaction with those particles that depend on those particle masses. So we could predict all of this, and then it just depends also on the Higgs mass. So 
we knew this is our best rate form of production, and there are some others that are also going to be useful. And this line I've got here is the actual mass that we turn out to be dealing with. So um, combined with the production, we then also have the decays. I mentioned before, the Higgs likes to decay to bottom quarks at the mass it lives at. If the Higgs gets heavy enough, it can decay to pair of pairs of Ws instead. It would much rather do that, because the Ws are heavier. So we live in this weird place where it's mostly bottom quarks, but bottom quarks are really hard to see. Um, so you also have to combine, eventually, what you're produced with to, and what you decay into and ask what your detector can actually evaluate. Um, and I certainly don't um, want to put you through all the details of this, but the Higgs to pairs of photons is actually one of the most effective channels, even though it's a rare decay, because we can take advantage of the most common production mechanism and because um, there's not so much that looks like it. So now let me get back to what a candidate event is supposed to be and signal to noise ratios. Um, so these plots are showing day by day appearances of events after a complex selection that's supposed to pick out Higgs bosons um, at a range of masses. And so this is the K to photon pairs, and this is the masses. And what you're looking at here with this line is a background only fit to the data, saying if there were no Higgs boson, what would it look like? And these photon pairs are photons that are produced in other ways, or fake photons. And the most effective way to model them is to see what's there. And if you see a peak starting to arise in the middle, then you also do a fit with the signal that you're going to see with this red line coming across here in just a moment, where, sure, there's a lot of background, and you know what the background should be because where, where this blue line goes. But right in the middle here, there's a bump. That's the extra photon pair events that are going to look like, that are going to be this case at this particular mass. So a candidate event is one of the events under this bump. But most of them are not Higgs bosons. It's just we see a few extra. And it's a, a big enough effect to be statistically significant. And I'll talk about that in detail. Now on the left side of this plot, you've seen another analysis with the Higgs going to two Z bosons that then go to some combination of electron and muon pairs, where again, you plot the max of the Higgs candidate. And there's a big peak here from the Z, a big peak here from two Zs, and then in the middle is where your, your Higgs kicks in, if it were there. And you can see, lo and behold, the standard model predicts this red line, and we have an excess there. So the other thing I should note is what we just watched over a minute of this Higgs signal developing is not what we do when we're doing the analysis. We need to build the analysis and determine what the errors associated, the uncertainties, I should say, associated with it are um, without looking at these plots. We look at many other distributions that are helping us do these estimates and validating our estimation techniques. And then periodically, say for every major conference, we, what, we do what's called unblinding, where we now look at these plots. And then you can go back and make an animated GIF to demonstrate um, what, you actually, what you actually had as a function of time. So I might actually, looking at how we're doing on time, um, skip some details here. But I've shown you the simplest analyses as illustrations. We also have cases where you have to um, invoke machine learning algorithms to combine many variables because your mass is only one is only one of several sensitive variables. So in this particular example, you have one strategy, which is you put requirements on all the variables that are helpful for finding the case, and then you make a mass plot. And here's where it would be. This is actually the analysis I work on. Um, and you can see perhaps that uh, the data and the signal, the, the data and this combined prediction, which is the stack of all these different lines, it's consistent with or without the red dots, basically. Um, and that's exactly what we published, although we quantified it a great deal. On the other side, we have this machine learning algorithm, 
it's producing a number from minus one to one. Um, and it's significantly improved if the mass is in the Higgs mass range. So this is then an intermediate step in a big messy analysis that takes a whole bunch of data and puts it into a whole bunch of plots that we then fit. And when you do that, you can eventually put all those plots together by which uh, types of events give you the most significance, essentially, the most statistical significance. And you see the red all lives over here now. And now is there an excess? Well, in the last two bins, it looks like there is. And then the very last one, there's one event. And two would have been more like it. But of course, we know it. if you have one event after running a billion, billion collisions a second for a couple of years, that one event um, could have been two, could have been five. That's statistical fluctuations for you. We still actually don't see the Higgs with this method. So in fact, we haven't confirmed at all, according to our own standards of statistical rigor, that the Higgs decays to pairs of bottom points. And it will be exciting to confirm that, because it will mean we have a Higgs that not only breaks electroweak symmetry, as I described, but also um, deals with the fermion masses. We don't know that for sure yet. It's why we're still running the LHC starting in 2015. All right. So known unknowns. Uh, the data has error bars in a lot of places. Those are roughly 68% confidence intervals on what we think should be in that bin, given the number of events we've seen. Um, I won't say too much about that. Much, much more complex and much more important are systematic uncertainties. That is, what if we're wrong in the energy we measure for all of our jets by 3%? What, what if they're all, all up or all down? Then we'll get a different mass for our Higgs boson. Uh, our analysis will proceed differently. And all of our estimates of the significance of our, of our results will be off. Well, how do you deal with that? Well, first, you come up with this 3% number based on what you know about the performance of the detector. And then you propagate the differences um, that would arise from that all the way through the analysis. And you're eventually going to assign <coughs> A, um, and you're eventually going to assign essentially a floating parameter in a fit to what is the jet energy really? Is it up? Is it down? Did we have it basically right? And you're going to let that get fit at the same time you fit for the strength of the Higgs signal. Um, and I actually will skip these very complex looking slides here that go through some of the details of the fit because it's a lot of math. and would take some time, but let me just emphasize one point. Um, at the end of the day, in the fit, as part of the as part of the fitting procedure in the error estimation, we're throwing toys for given different possibilities for the systematics. How often do we get a significance beyond some point with only the signal or with the signal and the background added? And then you look at the real point and we're estimating the p-value from throwing the toys. And then what we report to the public is essentially, if there, this were Gaussian distributed, these p-values, which we're not claiming they are, how many standard deviations would we be from the mean? Because we, we decided at some point this was good public science to say we have three sigma, we have five sigma. And so this is what we talk about. But the important thing is the p-values. And to really say we have it, we have found the Higgs, which is what the um, Director General of CERN finally said in July of 2012, took two experiments independently hitting this p-value here, 3 times 10 to the minus 7. And I will talk about why we have such ludicrously look <coughs> small looking p-values as a matter of course in our field. Quick, quick question. Yeah. Um, the 3%, does that come from the, the, the physics of your detectors in terms of the variability of what you Okay, the, the three percent in the systematics. Are you talking about? Yeah, it, it comes from um, the physics of the detector. It often comes from a side analysis where we're looking. You could balance your jets. You could take some common collision, something that's boring to us, right. um, and balance your jets with something that they recoiled off of the other way. And you balance the energy of the detector, and 
you figure out how accurately from that you can determine the energy scale. And often it's actually the statistical error in a side analysis that becomes your systematic uncertainty in the main analysis. Okay. Uh, but this, this is the, the business of systematic uncertainties as our whole is most of our work in doing an analysis. Just assuming, oh, our detector works the way our simulation says, is the easy part. So let me skip now to, to the results of the Higgs bidding um, that we do. We sort of let all these parameters about uncertainties and also the rates at which different processes, both the signal and the background, happen. And then we get, we can divide these. Basically, these are decays listed here, Higgs to B quarks, photons, W's I haven't talked about in a while, nor tau's at all, and then Z pairs. And then these tags are us trying to identify the production mode also, because that also tells us whether it's Higgs like. And then we look, what's the best fit for the rate? And one on this is the standard model prediction. And you will notice that inside these uh, confidence intervals, um, everything agrees but one point, which is really what you would expect if you had a bunch of random things going on and you did the best fit. You'd actually worry if it agreed too well. Uh, so we're pretty happy with this in the sense that we say, uh, yeah, it looks like it did. By the way, we really do worry if things agree too well in our field. If somebody shows a plot where all the points are bang on, much smaller than the error bars they assign, that falls under the category of things we give people a hard time for. Um, because statistics don't work like that. If you haven't done your statistics right, it can show up with things being too good rather than awful. Um, this right side is just a simplified model where essentially you can, you can not only take the standard model without the Higgs as the null hypothesis, you can also take other things as the null hypothesis, let parameters vary, see what fits best. And our best fit is not far off of the standard model prediction that lives here. And then we also see that all these different decays interact and all show up at the same point. So for now, it looks like we have a standard model Higgs boson. What could go wrong? I think you just yeah. said something really important there. That the experiment confirmed that the standard, you were able to observe the data that the standard model said you should observe within, yeah. your, within your confidences. Yes. That's, that's exactly what we have to this point. And we would very much like to see a difference. And obviously, the uncertainties are large. And in particular, with, a, with some of the particular particles that we still have very large errors on, I work on these because it's going to be exciting, especially if it doesn't look like the standard model and we just don't know yet. So, so the other important thing is that, like you said, you, you were you're actually, so you, you would have rather there was a difference or you said something like that? We, we certainly would. I mean, and the reason for that is because that means there's something you don't know. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're in the, we're, we have this beautiful standard model that answers all the questions it answers really well. Then we have other questions we can ask that I, I'm not delving into. But for example, what is dark matter made of? We don't know. If we found a signal that didn't look like the standard model, could be due to dark matter particles. We'd have a hint that let us understand more of the universe. On the other hand, if the standard model works, we could be stuck for a while, essentially. Wow. So you're searching for failure in some sense. Yeah. yeah, well, we, 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 until we're satisfied with a model of the universe that I think we learned not to be cocky about, given that uh, people said in 1900 there was nothing important left to do in physics. And then we found all the particles that actually exist after that. Uh, you know, we, we want to, until we're satisfied, we want to keep finding holes in our theories. Yeah. So you essentially become humble. <laughs> we try to be, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just impressed <coughs> that all the data that you have, and I guess a lot of people would call it big data. And uh, <coughs> where I'm from, what they do with big data is put it into some giant grinder, turn the crank for a while, and see what pops out. And uh, this has never struck me as a very good idea. You know, my, my opinion is that. Uh, being able to predict where it ought to come out and, and to look carefully for it, which is what it 
I think you're doing. Striking is a better idea. My question to you is, do you think that the canonical, excuse me, the canonical big data approach would actually work in trying to find the big boson? So um, we, we, we have an analog that's closer to what you're saying, which is instead of me saying, I'm going to search for Higgs decaying to B quarks. I'm going to build my analysis for something that's approximately the standard model. And then I'm going to do a fit. And I'm going to say, oh, the standard model is right within 50%. Um, you could do a search where you made many more plots and you looked for any discrepancies in any of those plots um, from, from, for example, the standard model prediction. Now, of course, we have a prediction. We're never going to give that up. But you can have more general grinders that you run things through. And the advantage of this is they let you find things you weren't expecting. And the disadvantage of this is that, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, if you look at enough graphs of enough things, statistics guarantees you will see p-values that are as small as you want sooner or later. Um, and so, I mean, we have, we have a hybrid approach because anyone can analyze anything they like. And our system for making sure we don't miss anything is grad students. <laughs> everybody needs their own thesis topic. So, you know, we can't have everybody, you know, saying I helped find the Higgs boson for their thesis. A lot of people are looking for more subtle things. Um, but we do tend to target what particular we're searching for. Um, now, I'll talk about some of the alternatives a tiny bit at the end of this time. 10, 10, 15 minutes? Is that yeah, yeah, I've got about, about 10 I should be able to do, I think. Okay. They're doing the instruction upstairs. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we don't have an emergency evacuation. Yeah. All right, so we're going to go historical. And the reason we're going historical is I now want to talk about things that have gone wrong, where we've had models where either the statistics or the modeling itself broke down um, and we got off on the wrong track for a short while. And I go into history to do that because A, we haven't found any problems with LHC results of this type, and B, if we had, it wouldn't be a great plan for me to discuss them. <laughs> better be, better to, to pick on sort of well-established stories, shall we say. So in the mid-70s, um, the discovery of a particle called the JSI, uh, which decayed into muon pairs, um, gave sort of people a new paradigm for we have this thing called the quark model that we now believe in, and it predicts these certain states that show up when you plot pairs of muons or pairs of electrons. Um, and so these are some that were known. This is a modern plot, but I helpfully cut off half of it. These are some that were known at the time. And this is the one that had recently been discovered, and it's slightly more energetic cousin. Um, so people wanted to extend this spectrum. And they were working in a few years later at Fermilab to do this. They were inspecting maybe this particle that they decided to call the epsilon. So in fact, the first thing that was called the epsilon was found in 1976, where this was their background prediction, essentially. Um, and most of these little bits here are one event at a particular uh, mass. And right here at 6 GeV is about 12 events. And there was a computation that based on the understanding of the background, uh, the chance of somewhere on all the plots they did, a fluctuation of 12 events that were closely grouped showing up was about less than one chance in 50 of that happening from the null hypothesis. So that's a p-value of less than 0.02. Uh, and at the time, that was good enough to get started and give some conference talks. But in fact, they named it the Upsilon. In case they were wrong, their group leader was Leon Letterman. And there's a terrific pun for this. Uh, oops, Leon. <laughs> it turned out when they took a bunch more data the next year, there's nothing at 6 GeV. And in fact, the real Upsilon lives at about 9.2 GeV. Um, and today, we've extended the plot I've shown you before. Here's our epsilon. And if you zoom way in with my experiment, which is the best in the world for this sort of thing, not that's what 
that is what we built it for, you can actually see there's an upsilon and then two higher energy relatives and resolve them very well. And now our error bars on these things are negligible. So what did we learn from temporarily discovering a non-existent particle? <laughs> um, one of the big things is if you look at a lot of graphs, if you're running as a field, if you're running many different experiments, you have to think twice about your p-values because you know, I think you, you, you figure out basically how many theses come out in your field a year, how often do you want to be wrong, and from that you can compute what you think an acceptable p-value is. And this is where we came up with five sigma as a slam dunk discovery. Uh, we don't want to be wrong every year, so the requirements have to be stiff. Now, it's an arbitrary standard, and you could say, depending on how surprising the result is, you know, maybe we expect we do expect the Higgs decay to be quarks once we already know it exists. So maybe we should relax that requirement a little bit. Or maybe if we're going to detect that neutrinos go faster than the speed of light, we should not detect, uh, we should not claim that it's happened even if we get a five sigma result. And in fact, the people who saw the neutrinos going faster than the speed of light didn't say they had found it. They said they had to publish because they had a very high statistical significance. Eventually, they found an error in um, how they were running their electronics. And this gets us to the real problem. You get these super high statistical significances not because of fluctuations, but because your, your models are wrong. That's when accidents happen. So another quick example that happened more recently um, at one of the experiments at Fermilab um, was this case where basically um, W plus jets in dense, the W boson with some hadronic jets were being measured. There was an excess found right on this falling tail. And if you subtracted out most of your backgrounds, you could turn that into a peak. And it had a, a bunch of significance, but it would have been very surprising. It didn't look like a Higgs boson. Um, it was much actually too common to be a Higgs boson. So, <coughs> We, we have a three sigma cutoff for evidence or observation. They didn't call it that. What they did was they went back and looked at how they were modeling their jets. And what they found essentially is that on this slope, if you can just nudge the green bit to the right a little bit because you model things better, then your peak goes away. In other words, the modeling of the systematic uncertainties and the central values being taken was wrong in a way that wasn't initially anticipated but people found. Uh, when they thought about it. And again, you have to be cautious when you see things that are surprising, and you have to look for places where you don't have the right model for what you're doing. So, right, as, as I've said, you know, it's good actually to pub make public results that you think are unlikely to be true. But it's not good to say you found something that you possibly haven't. So it's really worth careful publication, but eventually wider input helps identify these problems. So one, one thing we do to make sure our models aren't wrong is we actually, we have replication um, starting within experiments. We have multiple groups. One thing these multiple groups do, and this is partially because people are competing, they try to do the same analysis. They check it every step. Once we take the common data and separate it, is all of our processing exactly the same, even though we've written different code. This is an important check. It's why I get nervous when people talk about making the code from their papers public. You run the risk that people will duplicate your code, and the same mistake will be replicated forever. There's value, at least in the short term, of making competing groups try to perfectly replicate each other's results with different code bases. This is something we do. Another thing we have done in one case is we had two different versions of an analysis. One was supposed to be a cross-check of the other. Their results were different enough that we could not entirely understand what was going on. And if it was some unlikely statistical effect that caused two analyses of the same data to get a Higgs um, cross-section of 1.1 times the standard model versus about 0.8 times the standard model. They agree within their statistical errors but they're not independent collisions. They're collisions identified that were studied differently. 
So this is actually an interesting case that my experiment is has struggled with. And our first step was actually to come and go to conferences and say, here are our two results. We are working on reconciling them. It could be bad luck. We computed how, how unlucky we would have had to have been. Or it could be something else weird going on. And now we're finalizing a sort of final paper version of this analysis. But it's definitely, when you have this kind of discrepancy and you work through it, that's it ends up being very strong for the science in the end, even though, in fact, we did feel a tiny bit silly to go to conferences and say, it could be this or that. We'll tell you which later. Also, we have two experiments. Always, at least, you have at one of these big accelerators, you have two experiments trying to do the same thing. So not only is the code base different, all of the detector technology is different. You know, my experiment has a four Tesla magnet with a very large volume, um, it's possible for these things to fail catastrophically. So that was the first thing the other experiment is for, is to still make the LHC programming a success if there was one complete failure. But also, we just have different, well, different everything, different internal review procedures, completely different code, even for the starting points, statistically independent collisions. Uh, and when we discovered the Higgs, it was because we have these plots that look the same at the same place from both experiments. So this excludes, this is more important. If you have two experiments getting three sigma each, that's in some sense more important than one experiment getting five. Of course, we insisted on two getting five because we're careful that way. Um, so I have only two more slides left. So let me just briefly see if I forgot. I've, I've touched on some of the issues on the next two, actually, but I think they get to how we do science and how we communicate it. So let me just emphasize them. Um, anytime we're going to make any processing of our data public, we start by reviewing it internally, starting with experts inside our experiment who know the analysis. Um, and then the entire collaboration has a chance to review it and make comments. It takes us months to go from an analysis we think is basically done to something that's public. And that includes even taking it to a conference. Now, for conferences, we do things a little quicker because there's tremendous value in getting what you have out there, not only to try to scoop the other guys, which we hardly ever do because we have about the same capabilities as them, um, but also to you know, get their feedback, to say, here's our analysis. And then I show up, and I say, oh, here's something that I didn't think of that the other people on the other experiment are doing. And then when we come up with a final result later, we can put all of us put those ideas together. So we do have a little bit of a quicker turnaround for these preliminary results. When you, when you say the other guys, you mean Atlas and CMS? Yeah, for example, Atlas and CMS. There's nobody else anymore who can do the studies and things like the Higgs. Okay. Uh, so then final publications are even more formal, take longer to finalize. Um, and by the time these get to reviewers and journals, who are probably from the other experiment, there's not much left they can say about them. And that's partially because you can do more thorough review when you have the internal knowledge of how the experiment works. And it's partially because we actually think we've worked out the bugs by that point. Um, there are some lively debates sometimes anyway about different approaches in that stage. Um, so both our preliminary results and our publications are always available for free on this archive print server that I think Particle Visits basically highlighted. Yeah. And if you discover a, uh, uh, a problem after it's made it through that problem, I mean, this is a pretty good screen of, of, to get to where you don't have uh, you know, problems in your publication. But if you get to the point where there's, how often does a, does a mistake show up? So. I mean, mistakes don't show up very often. I, I picked a couple historical examples, and I can only think of a few more. Okay. Um, and our response to mistakes is step one. The other experiment looks for exactly the thing you say you just found. You know, you had two experiments. The other one, maybe they're on a different cycle. Maybe they just published a paper saying they didn't find that. They go back and look for it more carefully. And so the first step in us discovering something went wrong is non-replication of the result by the people who should be able to find exactly the same thing. Uh, and that's what happened in some of these examples at Fermilab. There were two experiments, CDF and D0. 
and the eccentric results that nobody believed tended not to be replicated. The second step is that the experiment goes back and analyzes. Usually they incorporate more data in the meantime, they do a more detailed analysis. Uh, so there is a tiny bit of face saving in here in that you do an update. You don't retract and say, we didn't do that analysis right. You say, we did it as well as we could, we outlined our assumptions, and there's what we got, but now we've updated, we've changed these assumptions, and we no longer see that feature. And that's, that's what, you know, as, as you saw a few slides ago, missed by one, by two even, sorry. Um, this is a preliminary result with one amount of data, and this is a later result with more data. So that's sort of, this, this can, can take a couple years to work through, but often we know informally much more quickly that there are you know, reasons to look twice at things, and they're being worked at. You can ask the guys on the other side of the ring, are you looking at this? Are there other problems you've considered in talking to them? So your sort of standards of acceptance are like the 2,000 physicists that are in this, this uh, you know, these, uh, set of analyses and so on, right? That's, that's the people that actually are the, the, the referees for all of the work. Yeah, I mean, in, in some, they're an important part of the refereeing system. I mean, they, the, um, I mean, the, the final the journal referees are very important because you have to have, you have to have, you know, it's almost an adversarial refereeing system ideally. You want people who really would pick it apart if they could, which, you know, you can imagine you have 2,000 people all invested in the success of the experiments. You have some disincentive for pushing people very hard on things. But on the other hand, you have people with a lot of technical knowledge who don't want to be embarrassed later, who do want to get the root and right result out. And so if I if I stand up and say, here's our results, here's the uncertainty from the jet energy, say, just because it's the example I brought up earlier, then a guy who works on the calorimeter can stand up and say, I know what our detector is capable of, your uncertainty should be bigger than that. And then we'd have to go back and look before we got it through. So my, my very final, non-concluding slide is just again null results. What do we do with them? We publish them. We run searches um, the old, and in general when we're searching for something and we don't find it that's still somebody's thesis topic even though they didn't find it. Um, so this Higgs to BV analysis that I work on, one of the ways we formulate the results is to put exclusions as a function of the Higgs cross-section to decaying to B points. So if it were, I'm actually going to come around for this, sorry. Um, we would expect, given the strength of our analysis and the fact that we know a Higgs is at 125 dB, we actually expect we should have already proven that the interaction rate had to be a little bit below the standard model rate. That's what this black, dotted black line here says. On the other hand, all we can actually exclude is we say, well, it's less than twice, which is consistent with it being the Higgs. But what we've done, instead of just saying we can't disprove the null hypothesis, we've said here's an alternative. What if it were, were Higgs with a stronger interaction strength? We can exclude that. And not only that, but our exclusion is consistent with what our exclusion would be if there were a Higgs. So in this analysis, we think we're on the right track, even though we're not. And then there's this whole other area called supersymmetry. This is a very you know, loose summary plot of different, a whole grid of different models that have been excluded down here by different analyses, which are aligned. And up here, not excluded yet. And again, there's, there are hundreds of people working on supersymmetry, different flavors of it. They've found none of it yet. And there are lots of publications about that. So after all these known unknowns and so on, wh what do we know? Well, we found something that looks a lot like the standard model Higgs boson. We don't know if it's V Higgs because we found it in the easiest places to look and some of the trickier ones we're still working on. Uh, model, modern particle physics, at least these big colliders, is dependent on huge teams of people with a lot of different expertise, um, all putting a lot of things together and communicating. 
um, pretty extensively, both within our teams, with the other teams, and also with the theoretical experts who build the predictions that are the source of all these models that I've been showing. So, yeah. There are a number of topics in physics that theoreticians work on that you really can't do any experiments with. Yeah, we what try to avoid this. <laughs> Well, what does the community, what does the physics community do with it? Is it a divide? Um, so it, we're very specialized. You, you, you may get this sense, um, actually, just from my talk that within an experiment, we're already very special, specialized. Right? I'm a hates to BB guy and a tracker guy, and there are different different people who uh, who work on different detectors. So the golf then to a string theorist is, is large. And because of this, we actually, just within particle physics, we tend to divide things in three. There's the experimentalists who build and run the analyses on these experiments. And some of the analytical steps would be theoretical work in other fields. Evaluating different models based on data is sometimes theoretical work. Well, it's all experimental work to us. Then we have phenomenologists who are in the business of detailed calculations for the LHC. It's targeted towards something real. And then you have hardcore theorists who are trying to um, solve problems coming at them from general principles. Not what inconsistencies can we find between um, the standard model and our data, and what does that tell us about what to look for next, but rather what would a theory that really described everything look like? That's the question that string theory tries to answer. It's very successful, but we can't test it for a while, and what can we do at that point but um, all do our own thing on some level? Like the, the aesthetics motivating string theorists are good, and maybe some someday we'll find a way to <coughs> test their predictions. And um, I, think, I think everyone on both sides looks forward to that. Looks like our speaker. <laughs>